I hadn't sung that song that we sang just a moment ago before. I hadn't really uh, noticed that in the book. I hadn't looked at the lyrics, but that, that idea that his strength is made perfect in our weakness, that he, he works where we have nothing intrinsic of our own to, to make us what he wants us to be. That is connected very, very closely to uh, the theme that I, I've been asked to discuss here out of Psalm 8, 4. What is man that God is mindful of us? Lord willing, we'll notice several connections as we go through the, the, the study this evening, but that song fits our, our first study perfectly. And so I'm glad to, uh, to have had that opportunity. Now, as we noted, the question comes from the eighth psalm. And this psalm represents the prophet David's reflections on God's creation, specifically on how man or mankind fits within all that God has made and God's great plan for the universe. What makes humanity special, so special that God himself has taken a personal interest in our fate? The answer to this question forms a thread that connects the very first words of the Bible with the creation of man, uh, all the way to the very end, through the work of Christ and beyond our lives into eternity. Who are we, in the grand scheme of things, to deserve such special care? Now David introduces this concept uh, with a line of thought. The whole uh, psalm deals with this question. He starts by recounting how he got to, to this question in the first place. We'll read Psalm 8, 1 through 4. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? First, to set the tone of this whole study, this is a psalm of praise. David is praising God's work and God's design in creation. He pronounces that the glory of God is visible in all the earth and above all the heavens. Thus, from the very start, our focus is set on the entire creation, from beginning to end. We can find signs of God's creative work and power and his glory in every part of the world around us. The intricacies of the natural systems that we see in the earth, the water cycle, the balance of ecosystems, the laws of physics and chemistry, and, and we could go on, all of these things show us that we, we are ruled and we have been created by a, an ingenious and a powerful God. Every one of these things is a testimony to his wisdom and his ability to create a world out of nothing. However, although God himself possesses irresistible strength, and although he has created many mighty and immovable things in the creation, he has chosen what is weak to glorify him. David mentions babies and nursing infants. Uh, he's chosen to use these to prove his power and his dominion over those who would oppose him. When we think of God's enemies, we can think specifically of the devil and generally of all of those who follow him into rebellion against God and against his design for creation. Satan is a more powerful being than any living human. But God has specifically chosen to empower those who are weak and those who are helpless to put to shame those who are strong. See also 1 uh, Corinthians 1, where Paul lays out this concept in great detail. Those who are helpless cannot be taken if God is their defender. And those who are weak cannot be bested if God is their strength. And it is a self-evident truth that humanity is not the strongest force in creation. David considered the heavens. He looked to the skies above him, to the moon and the stars. These are mighty. These are massive. And these are unreachable to humanity. We know more of these things scientifically than David did back in his day. But uh, even now, we cannot reach even one star. 
We cannot make any kind of change or modification in how the moon moves through the sky or the pattern of the stars that we see at night or how the planets move in relation to them. When we think of the power and the mastery and the, the control over creation that it would require to change even one of these things, we can see why David started to question his own place in the universe when he looked up at the heavens. As king, his position in Israel was lofty. He had a lot of power by human standards. But when he looked to the skies above, he realized just how little real power he possessed. And so he asked that immortal question, what is man that God, who made all of these things, would care about us? Why has God worked through generation after generation to rescue us from our sins and to guide us toward a better end than we could achieve ourselves? Why has he chosen to help us, the weak elements of his creation, to put to shame those who would oppose him? David answers, in a way, by pointing back to the very beginning when God created man. Psalm 8, 5 through 9, the rest of the psalm says, For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Notice that in all of these things, God is the active agent. All that we have as a species, as humanity, our position a little lower than the angels, our glory, our honor, and our dominion over God's creation, all of this is ours only because God has given it to us. We do not have some intrinsic strength or intrinsic character by which we have fought or clawed our way to dominion or authority and power. Instead, all that we have has been given to us. God chose to place us a little lower than the angels. He chose to show his glory and his honor through us. And he chose to place all things under the feet of humanity. The language that David uses in verses 6 through 8 reflects back on Genesis 1, when God created everything that exists. God made the three great habitats of creation, so to speak. He made the sea, the sky, and the land. And he populated them with creatures that correspond to each territory. And last of all, he created Adam and Eve, to whom he gave three simple commands. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Genesis 1.28. When he commissioned man to subdue these things, he assigned strength and glory and honor to those who were weak and helpless in view of all that God had made. Adam and Eve could not have created the heavens and the earth, nor could they have ruled them if God had not given them that commission. They only had the strength and ability to do the work of God because God gave it to them. He had created these things to be ruled, and now he had created and appointed his chosen ruler. So what does Psalm 8 teach us about God's care for humanity? There's nothing intrinsic in our nature that makes us better or stronger than the other elements of God's creation. Instead, God has chosen us because of our weakness to rule over what his hands have made. He cares for us because he wishes to see us fulfill his purpose, his design that he had from the very beginning to glorify him by faithfully fulfilling the role that he has made for us. It is because of this purpose that God sent his only son so that we can not only continue, uh, continue the process of subduing the, the rest of creation, but that through Christ we can finish the work that God gave to us and reign with him for eternity. This is the theme that drives the second chapter of the book of Hebrews. We'll turn there now. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. But when testified in a certain place, saying, 
What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For, the, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. So the author of the book of Hebrews starts his discussion in this chapter by introducing the world to come. When the Bible speaks of the world to come, we're, we're looking at the final state of things, the, the way things will be after Christ's final judgment has restored order and purity to all of God's creation, and the fires of vengeance have consumed all that is corrupt and sinful. Peter tells us that when the world around us has melted with an intense heat, we look forward to God's promise of a new heavens and a new earth, 2 Peter 3.13. Now, I don't pretend to know exactly what this means or what this describes. I don't have any special insight or more than anyone else here on what the final state of things will be. But when, when the Bible speaks of the world to come, the one that is not yet, but the one that will be established, this seems to be what is in consideration. Now, when he's talking about the world to come, the Hebrew author appeals back to Psalm 8, to prove that this world has been placed in subjection to man and not to angels. God has appointed mankind to an office, an authoritative role in his creation. He has placed all things in subjection under him, and the Hebrew author encourages us to take this at face value. God has appointed us to authority over all the works of his hands. And the Hebrew author says very emphatically, this excludes nothing. There is nothing that is not included in this commission. But it is self-evident when we consider our position in the world today that we do not currently have this kind of authority. We don't have mastery over the world around us. As David looked to the heavens and realized just how small and insignificant he was in relation to the powerful and immovable things of God's creation, even so now, we can look at those same powers and see that we are no closer than David was, not, not in our temporal state as we are today. We see that we are, we are less powerful, lesser in position to even the angels. But we can be amazed that God has appointed us to a position higher than them, higher than the angels in the world to come, despite our humble state in the world today. The Hebrew author continues in uh, verses 9 through 16. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham." Now, verses 5 through 8 that we studied before prove that the office that God has appointed to humanity uh, you know, proved what that office was, as well as our inability to fill that office. God has appointed us to a position beyond our ability and beyond our current attainment. Just as David noticed in Psalm 8, so the Hebrew author points out in this place, what we have, we have only with God's help. Thus, when we look at natural humanity, we only see weakness 
and inability. But when we look at Jesus, we see strength and authority. He is a, a, a successful counterpart, if you will, to us in our failures. Jesus has accomplished all that we have failed to do, and now he enjoys the mastery and the authority over God's creation that was promised to man in the beginning, or was assigned to man in the beginning. But the great hope of the gospel for us is that Jesus did not become human, and he did not qualify himself for, for the office that was assigned to us, and the authority that was assigned to us, so that he could replace us. No. No. All that he did, he did so that he could give us aid. He became a man, and he endured all the sufferings of flesh and blood so that he could bring many sons to glory. He has made himself our brother so that he can show us the way to overcome our weaknesses and through his atoning work to qualify us for the work that we have failed to accomplish ourselves. The Hebrew author appeals to this, uh, appeals to death as a clear example of the kind of work that God has, or that Christ has done for us, and the help that he offers to us as we accomplish God's purpose. We are bound by death. Not one of us has the power to defeat death or to overcome its, its sway over us. Thus, as long as we still die, we have not attained and we cannot have the kind of authority and dominion that God gave to us in the beginning. However, when Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, and rose again the third day, he changed our enemy's greatest weapon against us into a medium of strength and perfection. Our weakness is revealed in death, but God's strength has made it our greatest victory. This is the hope that we have in Christ. The chapter concludes in verses 17 and 18. Therefore in all things he had, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Therefore, because God has a purpose for humanity, because he has appointed us to glory and honor and authority far above our own natural position in creation, because we are weak and unable to attain this position on our own, and because God, despite all of this, wants to see his creation fulfill its original design, Christ had to come. He had to become a man. And he had to fulfill his work in a way that helps us overcome our every weakness. All of this is because God made a plan in the beginning, and he will move heaven and earth to accomplish it. If we will commit ourselves to him and his purpose, the purpose he made us to accomplish, there is no help that we need that God will withhold. This is the nature and purpose of man. And this is why God cares for us and visits us in our weakness. Thank you.